So for almost two months, as a congregation, we're asking this one simple question. Who am I? Who am I? But it's not a simple question. I should say this. It doesn't have simple answers. It's a simple question. Who am I? But we live in a time, a day, and an age where the world and culture that's always been confused is particularly confused and has lots of ways to bring that message of confusion to the hearts and minds of adults and teens and children. And so it's so important that, that we who have come to the cross and received Jesus look at this book and say, what does this book say? How does this book answer that question, who am I? And it's important for those who are not yet followers of Jesus, who are trying to figure out the whole God thing, the whole church thing. We have people that are part of our, our congregation online, people here that are on campus in the worship center, out in the, family, in the family worship venue, out in the courtyard there. We have people that are trying to discern and figure out what life is all about. And we believe the answers are found right here in this book. Matter of fact, the word, the, the term the Bible actually just means the book. This is the book. This is our book. And so today we're asking this question again, who am I? And we're trying to understand what God says about who we are. And so when, as we've been learning the last six weeks, and this is our seventh week, next week we'll wrap up the eighth week, and I have the privilege of kind of wrapping up our time together on this topic. We're discovering that we are people who've been radically transformed. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're not the same. You're not. You change. And sometimes that change happens like this. And sometimes that change happens with little teeny baby steps over time. But we, we are transformed. We're empowered to live in different ways. We're not what the world says. What the world declares is reality, in many cases is wrong, confused, or a flat-out lie. Now, sometimes there's things in the world that we look at and it's actually accurate, but we need to make sure by God's word and testing that. We've been learning that we're not defined by our worst moment. We all have worst moments, things that are kind of buried somewhere, hopefully in our past, buried in our memory, but we still have this feeling like that defined me. If people knew about that, people understood that part of me. And God says, that doesn't define you. That's not who you are. We've discovered that we have been, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are adopted children into the family of God Almighty. That's amazing. That's incredible. We've discovered that we are citizens, yes, of this world, but more than that, we're citizens of heaven, and we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and the other stuff kind of finds its place. We've been learning and discovering together that we are not about our past mistakes, but our future hope. We've been learning that each one of us have been made in the image of God. The Bible says, male and female, God created them. God created us. God created you. We've got to ask these questions because God has answers that will transform our today and our forever. And so I want to ask you to pray with me that as we think again today about this question, who am I? That your heart will be open. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or whether you're spiritually searching and seeking, that you would say, I, I am open to hear who I am. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer. Our prayer is that we will get a, a new picture, a new vision of who we are, and that you will seal that deep in our souls so we don't believe the lies of the world. We don't believe the pressure of what other people put on us. We don't even believe the stuff we come up with on our own. But we look to you, oh God, and to your son, Jesus Christ, and, to the, to the, and listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit and look at your word. And we discover in a fresh new way today who we are. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. So let me ask you a question. What's your zip code? What's your, when I, I'm going to go one, two, three, and give me your zip code. One, two, three. He said, I know there's going to be math tests today. I know there's going to be numbers involved in, in, in church. So our zip code, where we live, our home, it, it sometimes can define us. It can kind of give us a sense of who we are. If you lived in the 93921 through 93923, and you probably already know who you are if I say those numbers, you live in an area that's kind of quiet, that is sort of historical, that's artsy, that's kind of expensive. <laughs> if you know the zip code, you, 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 that's why you're laughing. Um, you live in an area called Carmel, in Carmel Valley, and there's history there, and there's beauty there. And there's little teeny houses for big giant numbers, right? <laughs> and, and, but the fact that you live there 
doesn't define who you are. Who you are is way more than that. Who, who you are, who you are is, is who God says you are. Some of you live, I'm hearing a video game with laser shots going off. It's somebody's phone, so there, there we go. Okay. Like Galaga, what would we have there? A Space Invader, some old, uh, old-time video game. All right. Uh, if you live in the 93940 through 93944 area, you live somewhere that's touristy, coastal, magnetic. People come from all over the world to come to this place because of the restaurants, because of the golf courses, because of all the things that are there. You live in the Monterey area. And that's a zip code. That's, a, that's an area. That's a place. And it, it's a great place. Also, not cheap, right? But, but that doesn't define you. It's your home for a season. It's where you hang your hat now. It's your stomping ground for now, right? Great place. If you live in the 93901 or the 93905 through 93907 or the 93915, I did a little homework on this. You live in an area that's sort of Steinbeck country. The long, you think of like the Long Valley, grapes of wrath of mice and men. Agriculture. A place where, where the sun rises over the hills and the sun sets over another set of hills. You live in the Salinas Valley area. And for a lot of you, that's your home. It's a place that's uniquely beautiful. It's a great place. But it doesn't define you. Your zip code is not what you're all about. And I got one more for you. If you live in the 92801, and then there's a whole bunch of other numbers, even 82899, they're so far apart in one area. You live in an area that's crowded, that there's lots of traffic, there's hotels everywhere, but there's also Disneyland. It's Anaheim. It's that, it's that area. You go, <clears throat> I lived near that growing up. And that's another, it's another whole place. And there's, there's all kinds of zip codes. And we all get assigned one. But that assignment of that zip code doesn't do assign to us our value or who we are. But our ultimate zip code is what matters most. You may have picked up a theme from the scripture that you saw on the screen earlier. A theme from the songs that we were singing. We sang a song called the hymn of heaven. We're going to think together today about heaven. And that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you follow him, you discover that I'm a resident of heaven and I'm not limited to this life. That my true home, my true home is a home that's up above. A place that God is preparing for me. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, for those of you that are Christians, heaven is your home. And you're visiting here. But your ultimate destination is heaven. And if you're not yet a Christian... Heaven can be your home because God Almighty has made a way for anyone and everyone who wants to come to join him for eternity and walk with him now today in this life. God has made a way for us to be with him. God wants us to understand when you ask the question, who am I? It's not just about your earthly zip code. It's about a heavenly home. And I invite you to open your hearts, if you're a follower of Jesus, to get a fresh vision of what God has waiting for you in the midst of those tough times and the great times. And if you're not yet a Christian, to get a vision of what could be through faith in Jesus. Because God has made a way and God's arms are wide open. And the door is not locked shut. God entered human history to kick it open. We just have to choose if we're going to walk through that door. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, God is giving John, uh, this faithful follower of Jesus, a vision that he writes down and we get to get a glimpse into glory, a glimpse into heaven, a glimpse into our ultimate zip code is captured here in Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 9. We're going to walk through this and just kind of pause and think through what is this saying? What is this telling us about about heaven, about our zip code for all those who believe in Jesus, about this place that God's invited all who will put faith in him. Revelation 7, beginning in verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice. And we'll pause right there. They, caught, they cried out in a loud voice. When you think about heaven, when you think about your, your, your final zip code, when I, came, when I moved to Monterey, before I came here to become the pastor at Shoreline Church, I did a pretty in-depth demographical study of all the cities around here to see what was going on. 
And, some, and, 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 and there's, there's a lot of diversity in this area, but there's certain zip codes that don't have as much diversity, and that can be in lots of different ways. It was fascinating to kind of study this and look at all the demographical information and the data. But here in heaven, in this zip code, every nation, tribe, people, and language, everyone together, so even if you're not around a lot of people who are different than you and you're a Christian, you will be someday. You will be around people from every tongue, tribe. And this is, this, is, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ from the word of God. Saying when you think about glory, when you think about heaven, every tongue, tribe, people, and language. One of the things that I love doing on Sunday mornings when, I, when I'm able to is to go outside in the courtyard and just greet people coming in. We have people come in from all kinds of backgrounds. And, all, and, and then because we have the Defense Language Institute, all kinds of languages, lots of teachers here were teaching other languages. I love it. We get maybe a little glimpse of glory when we gather as the church. Not the full beauty of it all, but this, this beauty of people from different backgrounds. I was thinking as I was preparing this message about our military folks, if you say to them, what's your zip code? They go, well, um, I don't know if I can remember all the zip codes I've had. I've talked to military people and say, this is our fifth assignment, our first, rarely our first because they're usually doing a language study, uh, sometimes first, but, then, but also doing master's work or do doctoral work. But they'll say, I, I can try to go back and remember all the zip codes, but, you know, but here's the beauty. If you travel from place to place to place, your zip code keeps changing, you hold on to the fact that you have a zip code that never changes. It's heaven. It's the place that God has prepared. I think of a buddy of mine when I went through college. Um, I had some friends, two good close friends that were missionaries' kids. And they had come to the States, come to a school called Wheaton where I, where I went to college my, my junior year of college. Um, and, but they, they were leaving their homeland, which was as missionaries in another part of the world, and coming here for college. And then they, they both of these guys, both, both uh, Tim and Eric, were going to be missionaries. And Eric wanted to be a missionary in Erie and Jaya. He wanted to reach aboriginal peoples, completely unreached people groups. That was his heart. That was his passion. And I could always sense he didn't totally feel at home being here. And I thought, that's probably kind of good because this isn't our final home. And, and so there's this picture of all the nations, of all the peoples. And yet, and yet they, they fell down with their faces before the throne and they worshiped God different and yet unified in worship. That they come together and sing and praise and worship and surrender to God together with a unified heart and a unified voice. That's a great picture for us. And then the passage continues. So now they, they declare, they, they sing, they shout out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down on their faces and they worshiped before the throne. They worshiped God. And so, so here's this, uh, this, this cry of worship. And, and it's beautiful because you see here that the author and the owner of salvation is the lamb. It's Jesus, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So when we're in heaven one day, it will be with Jesus. And yet there's all these heavenly beings and they're worshiping. And if you read the whole book of Revelation, it's kind of like, whoa, you're trying to figure it all out. You're going like, man, they got these wings and these eyes and they're flying around and they're singing. And, and it's, it's, it's just trying to paint a picture in our minds that, because our minds can't comprehend it. Anything we can put into human words in the Bible, as, it's, it's like the best version of getting a picture of what it is. But when we go there one day and see Jesus one day, we'll go, oh, I had no idea. I, d I had a picture, an idea. You know, the Bible uses things like streets of gold. Why? because it's the most valuable thing we can think of. But what it will be like, and the glory and the beauty will be staggering beyond comprehension. And, and, and so the lamb is there and the heavenly beings are there. They're unified in worship. And then, and then they sing these words. They say, amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is a declaration to God Almighty. Listen to it again. Listen to these words. They say, amen, which means, may it be so, so be it, amen. And this is what we give to God. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, amen. amen. Read it with me if you want to, if you're willing to, read it with me. They said, amen, amen. 
praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Wow, that's that declaration, right? We worship him. Amen. There will be celebration. There will be worship and it will last forever and ever and ever. And here's the beauty. Our zip codes here in this world, uh, the, we can say, I love being here, but you know, the taxes seem to be going up. Have you figured out yet, if, if, you hap- if you happen to get to where you can buy a home, and many people can't, but if you, if you happen to get to that place where you can actually buy a home, once you've paid it off, you still have to keep paying just to sit on the ground it's on. But then, in glory... It's all paid for by the lamb who was slain. Here, we get rainy days and we get sunny days. And these days, if you get like a pressure headaches, you're in it right now because it's like every time the city, you know, it's like, well, sometimes it's rainy, sometimes it's cloudy. But in heaven, everything will be made right. Even as nice as things can be here, and we, we live in a uniquely beautiful part of the world, but it's not perfect. And we don't cling to it like this is what lasts forever. Because it doesn't. Look with me at John chapter 14. In John 14, Jesus is teaching his disciples. And it's a fascinating passage because in this passage, like happened often with the disciples, Jesus teaches something that's fairly clear and it's like over their heads. They don't get it. So they say, well, we don't get it. And then he explains it. And so for all of us, whether you get things quickly or get it slowly, Jesus kind of explains what he's talking about here. So in John 14, one through seven, Jesus is talking about heaven but they don't fully get what's going on and don't see how the pieces fit together. John 14, one says, do not let your hearts be troubled. This is Jesus speaking. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus says. My father's house has many rooms. Older translations would say, you know, many mansions, many places, many homes, but my father's house has many rooms. The picture is there's lots of space. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there, Jesus says, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And then Jesus says, you know the way to the place where I am going. We'll hit the pause button there for a minute. He says, you know the place, you know the way to the place I'm going. So just in this passage, we see that God is actually, this is so personal. God says, I'm making space for you. Because I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to make a spot for you. Whether it's in my father's house or many mansions or many rooms, The point is our brains can't comprehend it. But what's Jesus saying? He's saying, I'm making a place for you. I'm making space for you. For who? For all who would believe. All who would follow Jesus. All who put their faith in him. Right? And that's for the believer. It makes us just confident that he's prepared a place for us. For the person who's spiritually curious and trying to figure out the God thing. You might be saying, you mean mean God would actually make a place for me to be with him forever? Through faith in Jesus? Yes. Yes. It's his greatest longing. It's why Jesus entered human history. Because he loves us and he wants us to come to be with him. But Thomas says to Jesus, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? So Jesus, we don't, when you're talking about you're going to prepare a place where? He's thinking on earth. Jesus is thinking heaven. We don't know where you're talking about. So how can we get there? How can we find the way there? They didn't get it as often was the case. We don't always get it, but Jesus gives clarity because he loved his disciples. He loves us. So in verse six, Jesus answered, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well for from now on you do know him and you have seen him. Jesus actually said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. I and the father are one. So Jesus says, okay, Thomas, The rest of you, you don't know where I'm going. You don't know how to get there. Let me be clear. I am the way. I'm the way to heaven. I'm the way to eternity with the Father. I am the truth. I am the life now and forevermore. Then he says, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And boy, people freak out over that verse. They like the first part, saying Jesus made a way. But when Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but by me, they say, well, that seems exclusive. But I think Jesus would say it's actually the most inclusive invitation ever because everyone's welcome. And the way to heaven 
is through Jesus because he paid the price for our sins and he offers to wash us clean and he offers to give us new life. When we put our faith in him, we can then come before a perfect and holy God. Not because we're so good, but because he's so good and his righteousness, his cleansing has been given to us. Here's the thing about Jesus. He offers it. He doesn't force it. He invites us into heaven. He doesn't drag us into heaven. He invites us to take his hand and walk with him in this life. He doesn't grab our hand and say, you're coming with me. But it's offered to everyone. So when people say, well, when Jesus said, you know, when Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me, that seems so limited. It's actually not limited. It's, it's universal in its offer. It's only applied to those who receive it. But it's a big enough offer. What Jesus did on the cross when he died to pay for our sins, what Jesus did is big enough to wash away all of our sins and give us new life. We have to receive that gift. And so I, I actually tell people, I've spent a lifetime, this, I shared this with my dad uh, be, when he became a believer, 30, he became a follower of Jesus as a hardcore resistant atheist his whole life, 30 days before he passed away. He gave his heart to Jesus and sincerely chose to follow Jesus. But I sat with my dad and I said, Dad, I want to, I, I said, can I share with you one more time the story of Jesus? He said, sure. And I said, Dad, I've tried to figure out how to make it as simple as possible. So I've got down to, I've got down to eight words, just eight words, the whole story of Jesus, in eight words. And I said, here's those words, God's love, our problem, God's solution, our response. And I just walked through that story. I said, Dad, there's a God who loves you. He made you. And that's where it starts, God's love. For God so loved the world. This is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins, it says in 1 John chapter 4. So I just talked to him about God's love. I said, I said Dad, God knows you. He loves you. He knows everything about you, all your past, all your resistance to him, but he loves you, God's love. So here's the second thing, our problem. We've turned our hearts from God. We've walked the other way. We've sinned. We've rebelled. And when we walk away from God, God keeps his arms open, but he doesn't drag us back. So our problem is our sin separates us from God. So God's love, he loves us. Our problem, sin, rebellion, we're separate from God, but God's solution. And I just looked at my dad and I said, Dad, God, says, you've heard this because he, I mean, my parents raised us five kids to be atheists and we all became Christians. Three of us went into ministry. My dad's like, where did I go wrong? Um, he, he, was like, he was like baffled. But I sat with my dad 30 days before before he saw Jesus face to face. And I said, God loves you. We have a problem called sin. God's solution is Jesus. He died on the cross. And on the cross, he took our sins. He took our shame. He took our punishment, all that we deserved, the payment for our sins on himself. And he died in our place on the cross. And God's solution is that we would then receive that gift. And so then there's our response. Here the God of heaven is who took our sins, who died on the cross in our place. And he says, I offer you my hands to take my hand and follow me now through this life, to take my hand and walk with me into eternity one day. And our response is either to say, I receive, I accept that. Or our response may be to say, I don't want that. But it's completely up to us. It's up to us to decide. And that day, I said to my dad, dad, are you ready now to receive Jesus. I had braced myself for him to say no again because I'd asked that question so many times over the previous 40 years from the time I became a Christian. I said, Dad, are you ready today to receive Jesus? And he said, absolutely. He made that decision. He had said no many times. That time he said yes. So for all of you that have said to God, I accept, I receive this gift, that open door, you've walked through it. You belong to him. Heaven is your home. I, I, you, you got a zip code now. If you're in the military, you're going to have a bunch more zip codes before you're done probably. But ultimately, you keep your eyes on heaven because God has opened a way for us to follow him. And so we make that decision to follow him. Back to Revelation chapter 21. One more passage this morning. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 1. And this picture is just overwhelming and powerful and glorious. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 1. So John is having this vision, and he says, this is what I saw. Okay, here's what I saw. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. 
pause button. If you love the ocean, you love the beach, the point there is not that there's not any water. The point is in the ancient world, the sea was turmoil, conflict, political, personal. The sea was this idea of churning. So there's not going to be this churning, turmoil, and fear, and anxiety anymore. There was no, more, no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. And they will be his people. And God himself will, will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death. And no more mourning. And no more crying. And no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Your best day in this life will seem like nothing compared to the glory of heaven. The closest relationship you've had with another human being where you felt loved and cared for and safe will pale compared to relationships in heaven. The best meal you've ever had, the best delicacy you've ever tasted will taste like nothing compared to what the feast will be in glory. We don't, we don't have any idea of the glory, and we can't. Not in this life. We can't fully understand. But no turmoil, no anxiety, no unrest, beauty beyond description. In the ancient world, when they'd come to the tabernacle or they'd come to the temple, they, they could come only so close to God. But then there were walls and there were rules and regulations and curtains and things that they couldn't go past. Only the high priest once a year could come into the, the place that was closest to God. And this says, but no, God's dwelling place will be among the people. He'll be with us. That's glorious. That's incredible. And if you know Jesus, long for that, look forward to that. Live this life fully for Jesus, but have a longing in your heart for what is beyond it. If you're not yet a Christian, his arms are open. He's made a way. Whew. Ball's in your court. Right? God says, I've done it all. I made a way. Now you choose. Do you want to step in, become part of my family? So what does God say about this topic? What is the biblical blessed way to understand heaven? Here's some simple truths. Just let these, let these soak into your soul. I am invited, expected, and welcomed. I am invited, I'm expected, and I'm welcomed. God has said, you are welcome. I open my arms. I have made a way. Know that. Whether you're a follower of Jesus now or still searching and seeking, you're invited, you're expected, there's room, and you're welcomed. Another truth. I am destined for incomprehensible connection with my God. In your moments where you have felt the most intimate with God, the closest to him in prayer, and in a sweet moment where you sense God's presence with you, that was glorious and beautiful, praise the Lord, but that will pale compared to every moment of forever because we will be with him and he will be with us. It will be glorious beyond our recognition or imagination. And I am headed for perfect paradise. Physical pain, gone. Emotional and relational turmoil, Gone. All old things made new and right again. Community with people and with God. Intimacy with Jesus. That's what lies ahead. Here's the dilemma. Here's the problem in our life today, in our world today. Is that the world says something very different. The world says confused and corrupted things. The world lies. And, and the message of the world is so dark and so depressing Look at our culture. Look what's happening with the next generation coming up. The level of depression and anxiety because they're, they're filled with the message of this world again and again and again. So the world is saying things like this. The world will make you feel like this. You are a temporary and insignificant blip on the map of human history. You are an accident to start with. You're here for a splash in the pan. Your life barely makes a ripple. And then you die. You're worm food. And there's nothing beyond that. Enjoy your life. <laughs> yeah, no wonder people are depressed and discouraged. They're looking at this and not at this. They're being told that that's a joke and a lie, and this is what's really real. But here's the thing. This is just temporary. 
Our zip code now is just temporary. That's forever and ever. We can't believe the confused, corrupted message of the world. The world will say things like this. You might be knocking, but no one's home. You religious people, you may, you're, one day you're going to think you're going to knock on the door of heaven. Guess what? The world says, there's no one there. No door to open. Just believe it. Believe that there's nothing beyond this life. That's just, that's just dark. And it's a lie. The truth is, he's going to prepare a place. And as, as you draw near to him in this life and forevermore, his arms are open. Come in. It's a feast. It's a party. It's glorious. It's better than anything you've ever imagined. It's the opposite of what this world says. We've got to hold on to that and believe that. The world says to us, you're ultimately alone. You believe this world long enough. You're alone. Just, you, you just go through this, this world. You can't trust anyone. People are going to wrong you. And we live in a broken world where people wrong us. I'm not saying they don't. But the world will give you this sense that you're alone. And, and what that does to the soul, it just damages and discourages us. But the word of God says that you not only have community now in the family of God, and we're actually going to talk about that next Sunday in the final week of the series, but also forevermore, that you will be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. That you will be with those who've gone before. Read the book of Hebrews. Read the book of Revelation. Those who've gone before will be there with them again. I will see my dad again. My dad, I think my dad will greet me in glory and say, I had no idea. My dad got to follow Jesus for 30 days before he passed away. But now he sees him face to face. Right? I'll see Grandma Lois, who used to every single Sunday as a young pastor, she was a woman in our church. Everyone called her Grandma Lois, Lois Van Heitzma. And every Sunday, she'd, she would see me, and she'd just come right at me like this. Very slowly, but yeah, it's like a heat-seeking missile, wherever I went. And she'd get to me, and she'd just put her arms around me. But she's with Jesus now. I sat with her and Pete when he was breathing his last breath of life. And we read Psalm 23 together. And she said goodbye to her husband from her child, from her youngest days. She was a childhood sweetheart. And then Grandma Lois went to be with Jesus. But I'll see her again. And I will, I know that. I'll see Michelle. Michelle, I was a youth pastor. Her parents came to visit us in Michigan. I had moved to Michigan for my ministry there. And she was, the, she was in my youth group, she was the first one to baby, you know, she babysat. It was actually her, par her parents and her who did most of the babysitting for our first child. And while her parents were there, a hyped up, drugged up, drunk guy ran her down and killed her just out of high school. And I flew back from Michigan to California to do her funeral. But I'll see her again. I will see her again. Amen. And, and, and what a day that will be. And John and Grace Shaw and Warren and Jeannie Burgess, my mentors as a young pastor. C.S. Lewis, J.R. Tolkien. <laughs> I, I can't wait to sit with these brilliant minds. And I, we're going to have forever. Is, is heaven going to be boring? No! Because God's not boring and people aren't boring and we're going to be together forever and ever and ever. I got questions for Peter, the apostle. I want to talk to Mary Magdalene and say, what, what was it like to be possessed by demons, set free and to walk with Jesus? This is our forever. This is glorious. But the world says you're alone and God says, oh no, you got a family, a forever family. Every week we ask this question, how should I view myself and others? What should I, if this is all true, if, it, if, if heaven is our home, if that's our true zip code, how should I view myself and others? What do I understand and embrace? Here's some things to understand and embrace. Every person is invited and welcomed into God's family and eternal home. Every person. Every person you meet is invited in. Even the really mixed up, messed up people that are so bad, they're almost as bad as you were before you were a Christian. That's how bad they are, Right? <laughs> but God's grace is big enough for them. In 2 Peter 3, just listen to these words. But don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, listen to this, this is our God. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Everyone to come to that point where they say, I give my sins to you, Jesus. I confess my sins to you. I accept you. I make that decision. That's what God longs for everyone. He will not force, but he will offer himself to all people. Right? You're invited. 
God loves me beyond my wildest comprehension, and he loves you just as much. We've got to understand the love of God greater than our comprehension. Right now, as we take his hand and walk with him, and forever when we're with him. 1 John 4, 10 says this. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins to wash us clean. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. When God's love fills us, it overflows. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. God's love is perfected, completed, and flows through us. That's the heart of God. What do we understand? That we have never met a mere mortal. You've never met a mortal in this world. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, wrote these words in a book called The Weight of Glory. And this is out of a passage that talks about the weight of glory of heaven will outweigh all the things that have been difficult in this life. That one, on the scales of eternity, heaven boom, outweighs everything. But he wrote these beautiful words. C.S. Lewis wrote, There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civil, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours like the life of a gnat. Those things will pass away one day. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors are everlasting splendors. This does not mean that we are to be perpetually solemn. We must play, but our merriment must be of that kind. And it is, in fact, the merriest kind, which exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. Every person you meet has the potential to be with God forever. And every person we meet has the potential to be away from God forever. And it comes down to our choice to receive the gift of Jesus and to receive his grace. So our final question we ask each week is this. How should my perspective impact my pathway? What do I learn? How do I live? If this is true, how should it change my life today? Should it change my life? Absolutely. So here's what should happen within us. I will warmly and joyfully invite others to encounter Jesus. I will with warmth and with joy and kindness say to people, this Jesus who I've come to know, this Jesus who's loved me and opened heaven for me and taken my hand and who walks with me every day of this life in the great moments and the tough moments, this Jesus, he loves you too. He's available to you. And I can't pass this moment right now without saying that to every person online, every person on campus. I've had so many conversations through the years with people who will say, I've been around church, and I kind of, I sort of think I believe, but I don't know for sure. Can I tell you today you can know for sure? If you've never reached out to Jesus and accepted his gift, if you've never prayed to receive his gift, his forgiveness, his grace, and taking his hand for this life and for eternity. If you've never done that, I want to give you a chance to do that right now. If you're online or on campus, just take a moment, just bow your head for a moment. Let's just bow our heads together. And I want to ask you, just in your own heart, between you and God, I want to talk to those who would, not those that have already received Jesus. I want you just to pray right now for those that don't yet know his love and his grace. But for those that you would say, I know I've never received Jesus. Or you say, I'm not sure. I just don't know. But today, I want to receive the grace and the love of Jesus and come into his family. If that's you, for the first time, or if you say you're not sure, but you want me to pray for you right now, I'm going to ask you to do one thing that may seem like a little thing, but it's, it's important. I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand. If you're at home, raise your hand. If you're in the worship center, raise your hand. In the courtyard, raise your hand. In the family worship venue, raise your hand. And if you have your hand up in the air, I want you just to look up at me right now in the worship center. I'm going to be able to see you right there in the front row, okay? And you're right over there in the corner. Yep, right here. All right, great. I'm looking up in the balcony. So there's some darker spots. It's harder to see. You just raise your hand. Okay, right here. Okay, thank you. Yep, yep, All right there, got it. And then just raise your hand if you're in the balcony. It's a little, okay, right there. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Right up there at the second row from the top, yeah. Anybody over here? Just look up at me, good. All right, and if, I, if I'm not seeing you, okay, right here in the front row, great. If I'm not seeing you, God is seeing you. If you're online, God sees you. So right now, if you raised your hand, or if you're raising your hand at home, right now in your heart will you pray this prayer? Will you say, dear Lord Jesus, I finally get it. 
I understand my need for you. I ask for your forgiveness today. Wash me clean. Take away all my sins and all my wrongs. I have been wandering. Bring me back home. I have had an earthly zip code. Make heaven my final destination and the, the reality of my life in this life. Wash me clean of my sins, dear Jesus. Take my hand right now. Walk with me through the rest of my life. And then welcome me into forever with you. I pray this, Jesus, in your name. And for all that have prayed that prayer today, if you're online, at the end of the service, I'm gonna, we're going to show you a phone number just to you'll text the word faith to that number. Please do that before the day. Do that immediately. Get, ready, get your phone ready. I'll do that in a couple minutes. If you're on campus, I'm going to ask you if you would come to the very front here with my wife, Sherry, and I. We want to give you a Bible a starting a kind of a Bible reading plan. We want to talk with you and pray with you, give you. And when you come to the front, I'll give you a handshake, a hug, or a high five, whatever you're comfortable with. But I want to welcome you personally and have a prayer with you, okay? And so if you're on, anywhere on campus, come by here. If you can't get in the worship center here, if you're maybe outside or in the, in the family worship venue, uh, Heather will be in the connection center with the same Bibles and she'll ask you to kind of get some information so we can follow up and walk alongside of you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the author of salvation, that you are at work in our hearts and our lives in this life and forevermore. And so God, continue just to speak to us and walk with us and remind us of your presence. We pray in your name, amen. That's not the amen at the end of the sermon. Two quick thoughts to wrap up. We also, just, I will walk closely with Jesus now as I head to my eternal home. If you're already a Christian, or if you just became a Christian, spend your life in this life holding the hand of Jesus and walking with him. Walk with him now because you can. It's not just about heaven. It's about how heaven breaks into your life every day today and you walk with Jesus now. And also, I will celebrate glimmers of glory now and stand strong in the heartaches of this life because I know what is over the horizon. I know what's over the horizon. I know what's over the horizon. I taught soccer for 11 years. I coached soccer for 11 years, about 25 teams. I love the sport of soccer. And I would try to, when you teach these little boys and girls as they got older, when they'd run and they'd kick the ball, they're looking like this. They're looking, kicking down at their feet. When they get better, as they, as they mature in the game, they actually can move along and keep their eyes up while they're playing. And the more you can keep your eyes up and your feet know what to do and how to, you know, it's better. That's a picture of the Christian life. There's a lot going on. And you kind of want to keep your eye here and, that, and that's good. But you know, as you're, as you're going through this life, just keep your eyes up, all the way up to glory, to heaven to the one who has gone to prepare a place for you. But he's also come to be with you by his spirit now. So walk with him now, and then walk with him forevermore. And if you're online, or you're here visiting, and we haven't met, and you're a follower of Jesus, here's what I love. After I give Grandma Lois a hug, and after I talk with J.R. Tolkien a little bit, and C.S. Lewis a little bit, I want to find you and hang out. And one of the things about being a pastor of a larger church is you don't get to know everybody but we have forever. And we'll use it well in community and glorifying God. Lord, this is our prayer today. That we who believe in you, we who put our faith in you, when we think of who am I, we say, I am a citizen of heaven. I am forgiven by the grace of Jesus and heaven is my zip code. And as prices here get more expensive and as life gets more complicated, Lord, help us keep our eyes up all the way up to you. And then let us shine this light of yours wherever we go. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for reminding us of our true zip code. Let us walk with that reality. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Before I ask you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, uh, I want to give you a couple invitations. One, uh, again, if you, if you are online and you, pray, you raise your hand and you say, I prayed to receive Jesus today, we want to come alongside of you. This really matters. Right now on the screen, you're going to see the word faith and a phone number. Take your phone and text the word. Just go to that, put that number in, text faith. We will reach out to you within a couple hours, or with, before the day is done. We will reach out to you. We want to get you a Bible. We want, to, we want to connect with you. We want to help you grow in your faith wherever you are, anywhere in the world, anywhere in our community. So please text faith to that number. If you're on campus here, do me a, a huge favor and do something, a gift for yourself. If you raise your hand and you prayed, will you right now, when I, when I dismiss everyone, just come forward, meet Sherry and I right here. We want to give you a Bible, give you a handshake, high five, or a hug, and we want to pray with you and bless you as you start this journey. 
All right? If you need prayer for anything, our prayer teams will be out on the sides of the worship center over here. And so if you're on campus, join them. If you're online, you can live chat a prayer with your host online or uh, you can email us those prayer needs and we'll pray for those in the coming weeks. And if you're new online, just text the word welcome to the number you see right now and we will reach out to you. If you're on campus here, before you leave campus, go by the Connection Center right there. On the left is Heather and she'll be there with Bibles for those that have made a commitment to Jesus that can't get in here. But if, uh, if you just want to say hello and meet us, go there and they give you a little gift bag and thank you for coming. If you're able to stand, wherever you are, online, on campus, stand with me and just open your heart to receive this word of blessing as we go from this time. As you go from this time together, remember, whatever your zip code is, if you've come to faith in Jesus, heaven is your home. Keep your eyes up. Remember that every moment of every day. And if you've not yet received Jesus, his arms are still open. Keep coming online. Keep coming on campus until you're ready. But know his arms are open anytime, anywhere. God bless you. Have a great day. And we'll see you back here for the final week of this series next Sunday. Heaven before me, the great-